or folder level with butter, um, which you know it, it's cool from like a home hobbyist perspective. Um, it, from you know a more professional perspective, it can partially be cool and partially be just horrifyingly sloppy, where you kind of can't keep track of everything that's going on. The other big thing that butter has that everybody has wanted for like forever um, is it's got on-the-fly reconfiguration of RAID. So I mentioned with ZFS, you've got a pool, and you can add VDEVs to the pool. What you can't do is you can't change a VDEV, really, once you've created it. Once you've created, for example, a six-disc RAID Z1, which is basically like RAID 5, right? So you've got the, uh, you've got the capacity of five discs in the six-disc VDEV, and you've got you know, one disc worth of uh, parity distributed through it, right? Well, you can't add another disc to that. That's a six-disc RAID Z1 VDEV from now until forever. You could add another six-disc grade Z1 VDEV into the same pool, but now that one's immutable too. You can replace the disks in the VDEV with bigger disks, and once you've done that with all of them, you'll see the, the additional capacity. But you can't just be like, oh, well, now I want that to be a four-disc VDEV, not a six-disc. Or now I want that to be an eight-disc instead of a six. It's just not that mutable. Butter? Butter doesn't care. Uh, with butter, you can have a five-disc grade Z1 add, or, or I'm sorry, a five-disc uh, butter RAID 1 um, add another disk and yay, now it's a six disk. You don't even have to rebalance it or anything. You can rebalance it if you want to. You can even convert that Butter RAID 1 array that you already have into a RAID 5 array on the fly. Just tell it, hey, Butter, that RAID 1, make it a RAID 5. It'll do it. You can keep using your computer while it's going on. Of course, it may catch on fire the next day, but, you know, that's, that's Butter. So, uh, you know, portability, uh, yeah, what systems can you use this on? Um, you know, a again, I hadn't really intended to keep making such a big difference out of people's ages in here, but it's kind of relevant. So, you know, those of us in here who are in our 40s or more have probably been through a lot of systems, um, a lot of different file systems, a lot of different computers, and, uh, you know, hopefully some of us have data now that, you know, they couldn't read that, that exists on computers existed on computers that aren't even around anymore, and it had to make a lot of transitions. So the, the more of those kind of changes you've been through, the more important portability comes to you, the more crucial it gets that you don't feel like, okay, well, if this particular operating system is no more, my data is going to be no more along with it. You don't want that. Um, luckily, both ZFS and Butter are open source file systems, which insulates you from that to a tremendous degree. But ZFS is not licensed under the GPL like the Linux kernel is, unfortunately. It's licensed under uh, the CDDL, uh, affectionately or unaffectionately referred to as the Cuddle. The Cuddle was created specifically by Sun Microsystems back in the day to license uh, ZFS and DTrace and some of their other intellectual properties under, basically uh, because Scott McNeely hated Linux. Um, so they designed a ver it was based on the uh, it was based on the, on the Apache license as I recall, and uh, it's 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 a very open license. Um, it's not restrictive, but it has just the right clauses in there. They felt like it would be impossible to combine Cuddle code with GPL code, so he wouldn't have to feel like his hated high school rival Linus Torvalds, uh, you know, would would be able to use his stuff. Um, you know, fast forward uh, close to a couple of decades and. There's a lot of controversy about that now. Uh, ZFS is very much available on Linux. Um, it was available first as a, uh, as a Fuse file system, which basically meant that it ran in user space, not in kernel space, which allowed you to separate the two so it wouldn't be a problem. It's also available as a loadable kernel module. Uh, the ZFS on Linux project is very mature. Um, those of you who are kind of interested in ZFS but haven't really gotten your feet wet too much may have heard a whole bunch of rumors that ZFS on Linux sucks, uh, that it's not reliable, that it's flaky, whatever. I can tell you right now that is not the case. I've been using it in very wide production for four or five years, and it is awesome. With that said, there was always the question, so like, okay, there's no doubt that you're within your legal rights to use Cuddle code and GPL code kind of mushed together. The question was, can you distribute Cuddle code and GPL code mushed together? And everybody kind of assumed that you couldn't because, you know, that was what Scott McNeely was going for back in the day, and everybody just kind of assumed that was the case. But ZFS and also DTrace, um, they are awesome properties. And people have sort of been like, man, we really want to use this in an operating system that we actually care about. And they started looking at that a lot harder. And you have some folks, uh, like the uh, Software Freedom Conservancy, 
um, in the Free Software Foundation who still adhere to the position that, no, it's not GPL. You can't use it with GPL code. Bad. You have a lot of other folks, um, you know, actual intellectual property lawyers. I'm not just talking, you know, random people talking off the bar stool who have taken long, hard looks at the code, at, at the, the licenses and said, you know what, I think this would stand up in court. I think we would totally be okay distributing this. Nobody has actually challenged it yet. Um, you know, the, the folks on the, uh, the, folks on, on the side of light, yeah, I, I'm very affectionate to, you know, Free Software Foundation and uh, the, the Software Freedom Conservancy and all those folks. I'm a big believer in GPL enforcement. There, there are a few really good reasons that they haven't tried to challenge any of these, these uh, uh, you know, ZFS projects. And one is that, you know, ultimately uh, they are in favor of free software. We're all in favor of free and libre software. The question comes down to whether you believe that endorsing these products is going to weaken the GPL or not. And again, opinions vary. What I can also tell you is that these folks are working very hard to lean on Oracle. Um, if you don't pay attention to the politics of the industry, a few years ago, uh, Scott McNeely had another hated high school rival, and I'm, I'm using that loosely. I'm not saying they actually went to high school. Um, Oracle. And uh, Oracle won that particular grudge match and bought Sun and uh, kick Scott McNeely out to, uh, well, you know, send him to that farm upstate to play with the other puppies. And um, so now Oracle owns ZFS and owns DTrace, and Oracle has been distributing DTrace and their unbreakable Linux distro. And uh, some of these folks on the GPL enforcement side have been leaning on them really heavily about that and being like, okay, look, you own this property and you really, really want to use it in Linux, so for the love of all that's holy, do it the right way. You need to do what you need to do and relicense this GPL so all these thorny issues go away. I have been told that they've been making progress on that front. They hope to make that a reality. But for right now, that's where we're at. We've got some folks fighting the good fight who think that it's wrong to distribute these things together. We've got some intellectual property attorneys who say, man, we have looked at that and we are really, really certain this would be totally fine if it got challenged in court. But it's kind of up in the air. But on the other hand, GPL, part of the kernel. Don't have to worry about it. Just have to worry about it eating your data. Um, one cool thing about Butter is it scales down really well. Um, there is a, uh, there's a project, um, Jola, uh, smartphone project. Uh, the Jola devs are like, they, I mean, no kidding, they are running Butter on their phones to give you an idea of how well Butter scales down. Uh, ZFS does not scale down that far. Um, it's just kind of not really what the ZFS devs are, are truly interested in doing at this point. Most of the issues that prevent it scaling down could be fixed, but to give you some idea of where they're at, um, you, you can no longer really reliably run it on a 32-bit system. You really need a 64-bit operating system to play with Butter. Now, with that said, there are some places that, you know, I won't mention, three <laughs> ass forums, uh, where you'll see people just tell you that you have to have, like, this crazy unobtainium machine, like, oh, you've got to have 16 gigs of RAM, bare minimum, and it needs to be one gig per terabyte of storage, so maybe more than that. And you've got to have an Intel processor. AMDs are terrible, and you can't have a real technique. You've got to <sighs> Things get kind of crazy in those forums. Um, you really should not take that at face value. What you truly, really need is a couple of gigs of RAM and a 64-bit processor. If it's AMD, that's fine. Um, I can tell you I've run this stuff in production with real-world usage data, depending on it, on like the cheapest possible AMD processors. Um, the, both the, uh, you know, the A3400 little APU costs about 40 bucks. There's also a little Tinker Toy processor called the Cabini. It costs like uh, $35 for the processor on a board. Like it doesn't even, uh, mo most of them don't even have fans on them. If they do, so the little teeny, teeny, tiny ones that barely spin, yeah, ZFS works fine on those. Um, so you don't actually need tons and tons of hardware. With that said, unlike Butter, if you have more hardware, ZFS will totally make use of it. If you've got a ton of RAM, you've got a ton of RAM for that wonderful, wonderful ARC cache, and you will feel the difference. So it's great to have it. Future proofing. Um, so you don't ever want to bet against the GPL. Uh, and, you know, I said this in, this in the original version of this talk three years ago, and at the time, you know, I kind of interpreted that to mean I thought Butter was just going to take off and leave ZFS in the dust because it didn't have the licensing problems. Um, unfortunately, the Butter developers didn't really do what would have been necessary for that to happen. It's still not reliable, so it can't really take off. In the meantime, things have kind of gone the other way. Instead of Butter getting closer to reliable, the ZFS has gotten closer to being GPL. Um, it's still something that we're looking for very hard to happen. 
Um, in the meantime, uh, just to give you some idea that, you know, if you've never heard anybody else say, oh, well, people are getting more friendly to the idea of mixing Cuddle and GPL code, uh, you know, uh, we, we had Ubicon, you know, here uh, parallel with scale. Uh, we had Mark Shuttleworth uh, addressing the audience out here. I don't know how much they talked about this, but the next LTS release of Ubuntu that drops in April, Xenial Xerus, ZFS is going to be in the main repos. You don't even need to hit PPA anymore. You can just install it direct out of the repos. I imagine that's probably universe instead of main, but either way, I mean, it's coming direct out of Canonical. So that's pretty cool. Uh, Butter may eventually be a default Linux file system. Uh, three years ago, I would have sworn up and down that by the time I was talking to you today, it would have been the default file system everywhere because, I mean, once you get used to these next-gen features, it is like actual physical pain to have to manage a system that doesn't have all these things. Um, so I thought, you know, surely it's already in the kernel, like we'll iron out the bugs and, you know, everybody, you know, Fedora, Red Hat, OpenSUSE, uh, uh, Ubuntu, you know, all the little tiny toy distros you've never heard of, we're all going to be running butter because why wouldn't we? But unfortunately not. Still, could happen eventually. All right. So we've got a few minutes left. And uh, who wants to see a live demo? Anybody? Awesome. Everybody loves live demos because it gives me a chance to look like a complete, pardon my French, jackass and fall on my face in front of a big crowd. And I like living dangerously. So first thing that uh, instead of trying to make this thing go mirror. All right. I'm going to bring up a VM here. And this is going to be fun because I'm kind of going to have to type blind. Uh, let's drag this thing over here. And no, you know what? I lied. We're going to mirror this because this is just painful. I think we got time for that. Displays. Do, 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 do. Mirror. Oh, it's not going to let me mirror it. Can I do it that way? Keep. Still not going to let me mirror. Oh well. All right, so I will just have to type blind. That will be fun. All right. We will fire up our Ubuntu Trusty VM here. So the storage for this VM is actually on ZFS. I'm running ZFS on my laptop here. All right, cool. So, da, 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 da. Oh, I actually need to give that the focus first. Fair enough. Oh, username. Fair enough. All right, awesome. We're logged in. We've got our Super Wimadine virtual machine here. And now let's do something incredibly stupid. I can even see. Can anybody tell when I'm like actually over the terminal icon? To the right? Can I click now? Oh, this is awful. <laughs> okay. Can can you can you drive me there from here? One more down? Yay! All right, awesome. First challenge overcome. All right, do I have a root shell now? Awesome. RM dash RF dash dash no dash preserve dash root slash bam oh was that no I was root when you're root you don't need sudo because you're root was I not root did my sudo dash s not work yeah but I'm, it was that in the dev file system because I can't remove stuff from dev or proc okay yeah, awesome. File not found? <laughs> Yay, we killed it. All right, so now our next challenge is, let me get a terminal over here. Terminal, no, not that one. 
Terminal. Yay. All right, let's drag this over here where I can't see what I'm typing. Now, this is on my actual laptop, not in the VM. And sudo s, uh, a bunch of asterisks. Okay, now we're root there, and we do a ZFS list, RT snap, Z images, Ubuntu dash trusty. Nope. I'm going to drag this over here so I can see what I'm doing, and then I'll drag it back so you can see what I did. If I could only mirror. All right. ZFS list. Z images. Oh, Ubuntu dash trusty dash working. That's the problem. All right. So we'll go over here and hit enter. All right. So you can see we've got our list of snapshots down here. Um, not being able to see is miserable. All right, so I'm going to do a ZFS rollback to my last snapshot, which was an, an hourly, which was automatically taken at 5 o'clock. Copy, paste. I'll drag this back over there so you can see it, or most of it, because, man, the resolution is low on this projector. All right, so hit Enter, and you probably can't really see anything, but there we go. So did ZFS rollback. Uh, Z images been too trusty working, you know, blah, 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 and it rolled it back, and that's pretty much it. So now we go back to our VM, which I really should have forced off for that, actually. Uh, I can usually kind of crane my neck and see what's going on better than this. Close terminal. All right. Where are you? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's you right there. All right, so, oh, this is awful. All right, I'm going to force it off from over here. Force it off. I promise this is a lot easier when you can see what you're typing. It really is. All right, and fire it back up again. Ta-da! So snapshots are awesome. Um, obviously, that was kind of painful for me, but you know, keep in mind that like literally, I just restored a system that I RM RF no preserve root root on, while I couldn't see what I was doing to the side of me um, in you know a couple of minutes. So that's a lot better than having to go to tape or you know whatever else you might do for backup. So and you know the other part that you know it's kind of hard to demonstrate here is I could replicate the whole thing to another box as well. Esther in the back. Um, not on Linux, no. Um, it's technically possible, but it's hideously difficult and would be a pain to manage. So I don't think that that's a win for me. Um, on my own, like workstations, I'll make like my home directory will be ZFS, and uh, obviously, you know, my VM storage is ZFS. But I don't really try to mess with the root file system because eh, it's replaceable anyway. I mean, it's a 15-minute OS reinstall away. So, um, you know, stuff that I really care about is like my configs, my actual data, you know, that might go in, uh, you know, my home directory or in opt or, uh, you know, like I said, storage. Uh, the question was, would I make home on ZFS? And yes, I absolutely do, because there's stuff that I really care about on home that I can't just get back with a quick apt get after a 15-minute reinstall. Um, but, you know, better than that, honestly, is just don't, where possible, I mean, so what you're asking is kind of an edge case for me. That's like my personal workstation. Really, where the really important stuff happens is on servers, and the whole server is a VM on top of ZFS, so the whole thing is an image, just like what we just saw, you know, with that one there. So, like, everything's covered. Uh, can, can you say that again, please? It's Correct. I, 
okay, so the question was, uh, it sounds like my deployment started on BSD and then moved to Linux, and the answer is yes, that's true. Um, there were a couple of years where every time I set up a server, I had the extremely uncomfortable question to ask myself, did I want package management that was sane, or did I want a file system that I could truly trust? And I had to pick one or the other. I couldn't have both. Um, once ZFS on Linux dropped and got stable, I no, longer had to, I no longer had to make that choice. I could now have apps package management. Um, I could have the Linux kernel. I could have all those things that I really, really seriously wanted um, and have it on ZFS, and that turned into a no-brainer. Um, I didn't just immediately reformat all my BSD boxes overnight, but I did, uh, I, I did stop deploying any new ones because prior to that, my BSD boxes, uh, they had for a while, I mean, I used to do everything on BSD, and like, you know, I would install Samba on BSD for file servers and offices, and, you know, I'd run Apache web servers and blah, blah, blah. But the issue that I, that I came across was that while using the ports tree was awesome in the late 90s and early 2000s, um, as the security situation got worse and as, you know, public internet access to like, you know, things that clients want to publicly expose got, you know, more and more frequent, I was less and less comfortable with BSD package management because it wasn't fast enough, so I wasn't doing it often enough. I wanted to get to the point where I could literally just say, you know, apt get install unattended dash upgrades and have security updates happen automatically while I slept and not have to worry about it and have it just work. And Debian gave me that and Ubuntu gives me that and FreeBSD didn't. Um, so once I could have both those things on the same box, it was a no-brainer for me. And now everything goes on Ubuntu. So the question was, is ZFS not kind of just a random collection of disks? And um, it's not really designed for that. I mean, there's nothing stopping you from doing it, but like if you have mismatched sizes, uh, it's fine to have mismatched sizes in a pool, but if you have them inside a VDEV, the VDEV is going to be sized to the smallest of your sizes inside that VDEV, so you're going to waste a lot of capacity. The other issue is if you mix a lot of different type of disks, um, and now this is not unique to ZFS. This is true for any way that you're going to mix and match a bunch of disks in you know, one big storage pool, whether it's ZFS or Butter or Kernel Rate or Hardware Rate or whatever. Um, the, the performance of that array of storage is going to track the performance of the absolute worst member of that group of disks. And the worst part is that may not even be the same disk every time. Um, if you've got six disks, even if they're identical, one of them may have a hiccup on a given read. Now, if they have a hiccup on, let's say, one out of six reads, well, then now instead of having a hiccup on one out of six reads, you're basically having a hiccup that affects your entire read operation on every single read. So in particular, if you have six disks that are really good and one that really kind of sucks, now all of a sudden your entire you know, pool is limited by that one disk that really sucks. So you kind of want to avoid doing that if you possibly can. So the question was, what's the best practice for installing ZFS uh, on a hardware RAID controller? And the best practice for that is, don't do that. Um, so here's the deal. ZFS doesn't want to be underneath hardware RAID. ZFS wants to have direct access to the individual disks because it does the array management itself. And it's frankly far, far better at it than you know, some little chip on a RAID controller somewhere. It has access to more RAM, faster processors, far better written code. And like, for example, if you were to set up a hardware RAID 5 array and install ZFS on top of that, remember we talked about all that awesome, you know, self-healing stuff where, you know, it just rebuilds out of parity? Well, ZFS can't do that because it can't see the parity. As far as it's concerned, it just has one big disk. Um, so that sucks. Don't do that. If you have a RAID controller and you're determined to reuse it, um, some RAID controllers can uh, be reflashed with like an IT mode firmware that will allow them to function as just a regular host bus adapter that gives you direct hardware access to the individual drives. And if you can do that, do that. Give the individual drives to ZFS and you're gold. Um, otherwise, pull that thing out, chuck it in the trash. Don't chuck it in the trash. Sell it on eBay. Some idiot will want it. Um, and get a nice inexpensive host bus adapter and put that in your box or just use the ports on the motherboard and go from there. Uh, you there. Uh, 
Uh, Butter isn't really good at warning you about much of anything. Um, basically, with Butter, I mean, you, you better be monitoring your logs. Uh, you, there, there are, there, and I'm a little rusty on Butter now because I'm, I'm not as enthusiastic about it as I used to be, but uh, it's possible to see that it's degraded, um, you know, using tools like a Butterfly Show or whatever. But it's a little obtuse. It doesn't always catch everything. And usually your best indication that you've got a degraded Butter array is that it won't mount. Um, because by default, and the butter devs think this is a great idea and can't be convinced otherwise, and I know because I've tried really hard to convince them otherwise, like if you lose one disk out of a butter RAID array, now it's like all your data is intact, but the array is degraded, right? So if you reboot your system, yeah, screw you, it won't reboot because it's degraded. And in order to mount at all, you have to pass, you have to pass the dash O degraded argument, which if you don't have that like in your grub, uh, yeah, yeah, it's not going to mount, it's not going to boot. You're just going to be staring at, you know, a grub prompt with, like, no way to get the thing back up other than, like, now you've got to boot from alternate media that knows about butter, that can go through, that can mount it, that can get to your grub, that can... Uh. I found that one out the hard way. And the butter devs, like I said, they think that's a great idea and they don't think that should be changed. So sort of. Um, now, and, and the, the question was, uh, do Butter and ZFS share a condition where you can delete a file and you still haven't reclaimed the space, so you're just, your disk just gets stupid full and you have problems? Um, there's a couple answers to that. One is that Butter has a really, really bad problem with not being able to reclaim blocks once the file system gets really full. Um, that is a bug. It's Butter specific. It's not a byproduct of some intended feature. It's just like, oops. Um, that has, that's not as bad as it used to be, but it is still an issue. Um, the other thing is if you've taken snapshots, just deleting a file that's referenced by that snapshot, no, that does not reclaim the space. If you want to reclaim the space that was occupied by that file, every snapshot that references that block has to be destroyed before the block is actually reclaimed. So yes, if you take a snapshot while your disk, uh, if you fill your disk completely full and then take a snapshot and then RMRF everything, you won't have recovered a single